Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world. Our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord lives forever. And this is the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. So if you've been along with us on this journey through the book of 1 John uh, these past few weeks, you probably noticed how critical love is for us as Christians. 1 John is so focused on love that I just feel like I've been beating you over the head with love week after week. And you know what? I'm all right with that. I'm all right with that because love is the most important part of our faith. It's the most important part of our identity as Christians. Jesus made that clear both in what he did for us and in what he called us to do for each other. And the author of 1 John, 1 John here doubles down on it. And that's prob probably because love was lacking in the early church at the time when he wrote it. Why else would this early Christian preacher, the author of 1 John, make such a big deal about love beyond it being Jesus' central teaching, of course? Because it's in the same way with Paul's letters. We get insight into the early Christian communities, into early Christian life by Paul and like the author of 1 John and these authors of these letters addressing problems and other issues in the churches at the time. And those insights that we gain are incredibly special. Because on one hand, it's, we just get to peek into these lives of brothers and sisters from thousands of years ago. And that's fascinating in itself. But on the other hand, there's a lot we can gain from these insights, seeing what they were struggling with. As we are still struggling with some of the same problems and some other issues. Clearly, we're still struggling with the whole love thing. It's not hard to see our deep divisions and hard feelings toward each other it's in this country alone, likewise around all the world. And sadly, it's not just the world that acts like that, you know, like outside the church, but church folk, us, we are right in the middle of that stuff, right in the middle of the fussing, right in the middle of all the contempt for one another. And even a look just at the church by itself apart from the rest of the world shows us just the same kind of stuff. Throughout the history of the church, it's split up thousands of times. Think of that in Jesus' terms. We are supposed to be the body of Christ, yet we have managed to split up the body of Christ into thousands and thousands of pieces. And I'm not talking about the bread. On that larger scale, we Christians say we believe in Jesus, Yet we are so divided that we can hardly bear to be in a sanctuary together. And that's just how we are towards each other. Don't get me started on the contempt we're known to show in all kinds of other people throughout history, um, people throughout the world, and from crusades to inquisitions to Christians today holding up signs like God hates gay people or fear-mongering about Muslims who are also children of Abraham, by the way, acting like anyone who's either not Christian or someone who's not Christian in the right way is going straight to hell. And, you know, we, we have even brought uh, our contempt, we, uh, how we slip into even the political contempt and, and divides, how we slip into that stuff. We even slipped into this whole maskers versus anti-maskers thing. We slip into all that stuff. Like, seriously, don't get me started on that. We, we go so far in our contempt for others 
that we even convince ourselves theologically that the best way to love someone is to get them to see things as we do because that way we can save them. We go so far in our contempt for, uh, for others that we reinterpret this special word called love so we can make it an easier fit for us. Now, I'm not just talking about Christians in the pews. I'm talking about preachers. This preachers preach this kind of reinterpretation of love all the time. Like sending missionaries out to convert the heathen. Right? Because if they haven't met Jesus yet, they must be heathen. I mean, that's, is that love? Really? This kind of stuff is embedded in our tradition as if love for another human being is simply about the afterlife. Get them to see things the way I see them so I can get them to heaven. Win a convert, check off that love box as complete. Meanwhile, that's not the definition of love that Jesus himself lays down for us. Pun intended. In the Gospel of John, Jesus gives a very serious definition of love. Or at least the definition of the greatest form of love. And this may be the very thing that makes us so uncomfortable that we feel like we've got to reinterpret it. Because Jesus defines the greatest form of love as laying down one's life for a friend. Any of us uh, would probably know, not go to that great extreme to describe love. Any of us would go for a lighter, softer, fluffier definition of love. The dictionary lightens it up. The dictionary doesn't go as far as Jesus does, for sure. The dictionary says, it uses words as like affection, admiration, holding dear, cherishing, unselfish, benevolence. All very true aspects of love. Nothing wrong with these lighter definitions of love. It's just that with Jesus, Jesus goes a big step further when he talks about love, when he lays it down for us. To lay your life down for a friend. If the situation were to call for it, what love looks like is me laying down my life so that you may live another day. Or you laying down your life so that I may live another day. Or you laying down your lives for each other uh, to live another day. Just as Jesus did for all of us. Well, defining love in Jesus' way does sound kind of like a burden. That sounds like an incredible burden to bear. Even Jesus was, seemed burdened by it. He was stressed out. His soul was troubled. Jesus didn't want to go through with it, but he knew that going through with that extreme form of love would be critical, that it would be essential. So he went through with it. He showed us the ultimate expression of agape love, loving us unconditionally all the way to that wretched cross. And while that sounds like a huge burden to bear, here in 1 John, this address to early Christians and likewise to us, we find that loving unconditionally is actually no burden at all. Love is not a heavy load to carry. Love is nothing to stress about or worry about. Even in the extreme case that it comes down to us dying for each other. Love is just what we do. Or what we're supposed to be doing. Quite a few of us Christians aren't quite there yet. Showing love is our greatest calling. Showing love is what gives life. As one author, Emily Askew, says, Love is an action. The definition of love here is a radical willingness to die, not for your child or your spouse, but for a fellow follower of Christ. And, and that, that is very true to how Jesus is describing it in the gospel. And while that's hard enough to think about being willing to die for a fellow Christian, remember what Jesus did when he showed us love on the cross. Love, the action word. Jesus not only laid down his life for fellow believers, he laid down his life for all the world, whether they believed or not, unconditionally. In the greatest act of love Jesus offered us, in, the, in his willingness to die so that we may live, <laughs> we gain life. Not only life, but eternal life. 
Okay, now wait a second. We were just talking about how love, this love thing isn't only about the afterlife and how we get all kind of twisted up by that. So if it's not simply about the afterlife, then why are we talking about eternal life? As it says in John, given that famous John 3.16 passage, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. It's kind of understandable how Christians have come to define love as just saving people from hell, saving people from a bad afterlife and give them a good afterlife and don't worry about this life. Uh, especially when you just cherry pick the passage like that, like I just did. But remember the context of that passage. Jesus explained that the, the cross by talking about the Moses story of people looking up to the copper snake on the standard to be healed from their snake bites, to be healed and saved in this life. So according to that Moses story and how it applies to the Jesus story, the healing, the giving of life, the giving of new life, the giving of eternal life is very much about the here and now. As we look up to Jesus on the cross, we're looking up to something eternal called love. And by looking up, by accepting, by embracing, by submitting to that love that we find on the cross, we gain love for ourselves, that something eternal for ourselves that we get to live, that we get to receive, that we get to experience, and that we get to share with others. Eternal life. By experiencing God's love, we experience eternal life right here in this world. Walking not among the dead in sin, but walking among the living in love. So is that reference to eternal life about the afterlife? Sure. Is that reference to eternal life first and foremost about this life on earth? Absolutely. Is sharing that love, that eternal life with others a burden? First John says no. Even in the most extreme cases when it could feel like a very heaven, heavy burden for any of us. First John says, His commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. Although Jesus seemed pretty burdened by heading toward the cross at the time, afterward it became clear it was no real burden at all. But a very worthwhile opportunity to share God's love with the world that needed it desperately. Today, we still live in a world that desperately needs love. Today, even us Christians haven't fully embraced this whole love thing that Jesus gave us. Or we've uh, redefined it to make it more to our liking, a little easier. So, beloved sisters and brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do with this thing called love? That which is the presence of God. That which eases our contempt for one another. That which brings us together from across our divides as human beings. That which lifts, lifts us all up and brings us back together with one another and with the Lord. What shall we do? Ignore it because it sounds too tough. Reinterpret it, maybe. Talk ourselves out of it because it's such a heavy burden. Or will we embrace it as our own? Well, I suppose that depends on what we really believe. If we believe in Jesus, then we will obey his commandments. Period. We will show love unconditionally to the extreme point of laying down our lives for one another to gain eternal life. And if we prove to be true believers, following Jesus' commandments, we will find out that love, even to the extreme, is really no burden at all. Just ask a mother. May we believe on Jesus' terms, showing our belief through our love. And may we find ourselves victorious seeing the world conquered by love.